This is Ham College, Episode 70, for October 31st, 2020. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Ham for the holidays. ICOM's new ID52A and IC705 give hours of fun and enjoyment working your favorite bands this holiday season. And by hamstudy.org, a great way to study for your next license exam. Welcome to another episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And we have a spooky subject lined up for you tonight. Well, it is spooky. Not, yeah, well, yeah, it kind of is because it's, um, it's a mode that, it's actually several modes that many of us may not have worked before. Uh, yes, that would be this guy. Yeah. I have done it. And I've, some of the modes we're going to talk about, I never have. Well, not on amateur radio. So yeah. what did we talk about in the last episode? Oh, and, and let me mention this. I always forget this. Anytime we're live, we're streaming live, we've got a chat room going on as well. Amateurlogic.tv slash chat. Jump in there. You know, there is going to be a test during the show. And that's where you enter your answers right there. <laughs> Actually, that's kind of how it works. It kind of is. If you're watching a live stream and you're not in the chat room, then you're missing half the fun, and it's up to you to decide which half. What was in the last episode, Dean? Ham's in space. Oh, it was, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And this month, we're going to talk about amateur television practices. There's Yeah, that's something that I have never fooled with at all. There's a Never. number. Of I'd them. like to. It just doesn't really. It's not around here. Nobody around here that I know of does it. Yeah. Well. But it would be fun. You can do slow scan. I mean, that's uh, done on HF a lot. So. Yeah. Not. Not that tough to do it. Um, really, it's not at all. Now, fast scan. Yeah, there's nobody doing that here. But we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Um, we've got the chat room lighting up there they are going to be answering these questions tonight and i'll be interested to see how they do on it it's uh some of the questions caught me by surprise you know and i used to work in television and still some of these were uh hmm, a little difficult i'll just put it that way yeah did uh did you go ahead and take my advice and put the buzzer in the freezer before the show so it wouldn't overheat i did not but um when i did this guy's teeth started chattering so (laughs) you know anyway okay uh how many times per second is a new frame transmitted in fast scan ntsc television system a 30 b 60 c 90 or D, 120. Well, yeah, I think we know the answer to this one. It's uh, probably, mm, I bet the chat room does okay on this one. I'm not going to give it away just yet. Give them a chance. No one has yeah, missed they're it. They're dropping the same answers. Yep. No one's missed it in the chat room yet. I'm going to say, and I'm sure you're going to agree too, it's A, 30 frames per second. How many horizontal lines make up a fast scan NTSC television frame? Is it A, 30? B, 60? C, 525? Or D, 1080? Hmm. How many horizontal lines? Okay, so it's not 30. That would be pretty, pretty bad looking picture. 
60 as well. That's horizontal. Five C for 525. I think that's probably it because D is high definition. And I'm going to say that it's C, 525. Most people are saying C in the chat room. 30 and 60 just weren't enough to have a decent picture. 1080, mm -hmm. that's full HD. Well, but, um, you know, HD is not measured in lines. That's in pixels. Yeah, so, well, it's yeah. akin to. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Uh, it's It's still vertical, so... Some of those lines are not actually picture. Some of those lines are used to send data along with the picture. And uh, a lot of devices don't show the, you know, all the lines, uh, particularly your VCRs that you had at home were, mm -hmm. uh, you know, VHS was, I don't remember what the rate was on that a number of lines. How is an interlaced scanning pattern generated in a fast scan NTSC television system. A, by scanning two fields simultaneously. B, by scanning each field from bottom to top. C, by scanning lines from left to right in one field and right to left in the next. Or D, by scanning odd number lines in one field and even number lines in the next field. Well, I happen to know the answer to this one, too. Yeah, I think I actually know the answer to this one, too. I'm, at least I think I'm kind of surprising myself. A few of these are more familiar than I thought. Yeah, some of these terms, you know, you're working with, with um, video cameras. You, you know, oh. probably a lot of these are familiar to you. Apparently to everyone in the chat room, too, because they are doing really well tonight. The answer is D, by scanning odd number lines in one field and even number lines in the next. Is that what you were going to say? It is. Okay. So far, we're batting That's 100. also called interlaced, and it drives me insane to see that on modern TVs nowadays when people send an interlaced signal. You see the little dot there? That is the electron beam. Because in our old CRT television sets, that electron beam is scanning all the way across the picture there. You know, one position at a time, it goes from left all the way to the right, drawing one line. And then you see the dotted line coming back in between there. That's a horizontal retrace. The uh, electron beam is actually blanked right there. So you don't see that beam move back over to the left-hand side. That's blanked out. And then it traces the next line, which, you know, we're skipping every other line. So every one of those lines that is solid black there, let's say these are all odd-numbered lines to start with, and the retrace is occurring during where, well, sort of between the... Um, the odd lines, it crosses over where the even lines would be. And then you see it, it does that, it continues that all the way to the bottom of the screen, and then you got a vertical retrace where the beam is moved all the way back up to the top left-hand corner, and it starts over this time, it's scanning the even number lines. Each frame of video is actually two fields. It's one field that has all the odd numbered lines and then the next one is the field with all the even number lines. And they come so close that your eye does not see that the picture is not solid. And that it's mm -hmm. actually being, you know, drawn across the screen there. Unless you blink your eyes real fast or, you know, some other phenomenon causes it to. Or somebody moves real fast. The photo we just looked at is called a raster. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. In just a moment here. The next question, though, because I'm really wanting to know the answer to this one. How is color information sent in analog SSTV? Is it A, oh. color lines are sent sequentially? B, color information is sent in a 2.8 kilohertz subcarrier. C, color is sent in a color burst at the end of each line. D, color is... 
amplitude modulated on their frequency modulated intensity signal. And this is mine, isn't it? Yep. I knew I picked the wrong one at the start. I think <laughs> you set me up. Okay, color information sent on slow scan television. Uh, sequentially, 2.8 kilohertz subcarrier. I, I really don't know the answer to this, so I'm going to have to just try to guess it. Color sent in a color burst. Color burst. I don't think that's the answer. 2.8 kilohertz subcarrier. Don't look to the chat room for any help on this one. Why? Well, because I'd, cheat, because I'd be cheating. Well, you'd be copying somebody else's paper, so you both may have the wrong answer. That is true. I just don't know. I'm gonna go with A. I, I just really don't know the answer for sure. That was a tough one. Yeah, and I just got lucky on that because I, I really and truly didn't know the answer to it. All right, well, let me give you some my I reasoning. don't remember that even being on my test when I did my extra, but it, it may have been there, but I just yeah. don't remember that being there. Well, let me give some some logical tips on how not to pick the wrong answer on this one. The, the first thing is, we you know, we got fast scan TV. That's the... Same as NTSC, you know, a moving picture like our old analog television. They're talking about SSTV here. And mm -hmm. um, B, color information is sent on a 2.8 kilohertz subcarrier. No, um, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not sending subcarriers or uh, mixing amplitude modulation and frequency modulation and all that together. Or uh, sending a color burst when we're doing SSTV. Because yeah. we don't have to do all those uh, things that can find us in NTSC, you know, so that we could have moving pictures and the speed of it and all that. We're just sending a still frame. So uh, you're right. Color lines are sent sequentially. It sends one line, then it sends the next. And it, it doesn't have to do the retracing because, you know, that's not mm -hmm. a, a factor in SSTV. Yeah, well, then, and the slow scan TV thing is what what kind of made me uh, veer away from some of the other ones on there because we don't want, we're not worried about motion. Which of the following describes the use of a, a vestigial sideband in analog fast scan TV transmissions? A. The vestigial sideband carries the audio information. B. The vesicle sideband carries chroma information. C, the vesicle sideband reduces bandwidth by allowing for simple video detector circuitry. Or D, vesicle sideband provides high frequency emphasis to sharpen the picture. That's a little bit of a toughie right there. Hmm. Yeah, a little mix in the chat room in there as well. Let me look at it. Which following describes the use of vesicle sideband and analog fast scan TV transmissions? Vesicle sideband carries the audio information. False. It doesn't. We're talking about fast scan TV, and I know the audio is not in a vesicle sideband. B, the vesicle sideband contains chroma information. I uh, don't think so. D, the vesicle sideband provides high-frequency emphasis to sharpen the picture. Now, it is C, vesicle sideband reduces bandwidth while allowing for simple video detector circuitry. So That kind of makes sense. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. I'm going to say C. Chat room's a little mixed. The, most of them, well, C was the most popular choice there, so let's see. Now, Nailed it. some splaining may be in order to even talk about what a vesicle sideband is. We'll do that in just a moment because I've got a question for you, and I don't want to give away the answer. No, I think you should go ahead and do the explaining first. No. What is Ooh. vesicle sideband modulation? Is it A, amplitude modulation in which one complete sideband and a portion of the other sideband are transmitted? 
Uh, B, a type of modulation in which one side band is inverted. C, narrow band FM modulation achieved by filtering one side band from the audio before frequency modulating the carrier. D, spread spectrum modulation achieved by applying FM modulation following single side band amplitude modulation. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say it's not D right now. I'm going to scratch that one off my list because I don't believe that's the answer. Uh, because the spread spectrum. Narrow band FM modulation achieved by filtering one side band for frequency modulating the carrier. Narrow modulation, which side band is inverted. I don't think that's it either. Amplitude modulation in which one complete side band and a portion of the other is transmitted. That seems somewhat plausible. I don't think it's B, and I don't think it's D. So I'm going to be down between A and C. Uh, Narrowband FM. I think it's going to be A, because this uh, says A amplitude modulation, which one complete sideband and a portion of the other are transmitted. And I, I don't know the answer. I'm thinking it's A. That seems to be the one in my, in my twisted mind that seems to make the most sense to me. Uh, take that for what it's worth. Well, the ones brave enough to enter an answer in the chat room are saying it's A. I'm oh, there really weren't very many, were there? No, there weren't. There wasn't. Come on, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'm counting on you. They, they weren't knocking the door down on that one. They didn't want to give it away. And it is a amplitude modulation in which one complete sideband and a portion of the other are transmitted. And well, I, I didn't think it was spread spectrum. And the, the sideband inverted, that's, that's, I'm pretty sure that wasn't it. And narrowband FM, I'm pretty sure it wasn't FM. So that left the A for me. And that's where I got there. Amplitude modulation. Well, let's do a little that, explaining. That, oh, sounds good. The way we're going to explain this is we're going to actually look Mm, roughly what you might see if you were looking on a spectrum analyzer. I say roughly because yeah, it'd look a little different than that on a spectrum analyzer, and they kind of try to emphasize some things here. You see that vertical line that says Luma carrier? That is the carrier frequency of our television video signal. Now, the audio is, is sent separate. If you look all the way over to the right-hand side, you see audio carrier. That is a whole separate transmission right there. The audio in an NTSC television signal is FM. It's not the same deviation. It's a lower deviation than FM broadcast. Back over to the Luma carrier there. That's the center of the video channel there. That's the frequency you were transmitting the video on. The video is an AM signal. You see that whole area there in gray marked luminance? That is what's being transmitted as an AM signal for video. You'll notice the left-hand side of Luma Carrier, that luminance there doesn't go as far. It's truncated. That's why we're calling it a vesicle. Because it's, you know, typically on AM, we'd have the same amount transmitted on one sideband as we would on the other. But you can see here the lower sideband doesn't go as far. It's less than 1.25 megahertz. It has been filtered out. And the reason is because we don't really have to have that at the receiver to, to decode the television signal. But... It is easier for us to generate an AM signal than it would be a single sideband signal and easier to decode an AM signal. So that's why one sideband is chopped off there. So we're not using as much bandwidth. And then that gives us a little more area to kind of get more channels available uh, in the spectrum there because otherwise we couldn't fit as many television channels and the uh, mm -hmm. amount of band that, you know, we, we were trying to do VHF or UHF television. 
The guard band is an area that's just a little safe area there so that the two signals from two different channels don't overlap each other. And the chromas, that is the color information. The luminance information is strictly, you know, like the brightness of the signal. The brightness. And, yeah, and yeah. you'd have for black and white. The chroma information comes in for color. And, well, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but I just wanted to show you trying to describe the lower and the upper sidebands being different. That That's what we mean by the vesicle sideband there. One sideband is is, uh, is yeah. not as wide. Well, that was a pretty good picture. It was interesting. Yeah. It's kind of neat stuff. Well, we're going to be back in just a moment. Ham for the holidays. ICOM's newest handheld amateur radio is the ID52A. Larger radio, larger color display, and louder audio. This VHF UHF digital transceiver is much more than a replacement for the ID51A. The color display is 2.3 inches for exceptional viewability, and the audio is 80% louder. This multifunction dual band D-Star transceiver supports DR mode for easy access to local repeaters based on internal GPS information as well as terminal and access point modes. The ID52A also has Bluetooth for audio and data control. The IC705 is the perfect sidekick for hams who like to enjoy what both the great indoors and outdoors have to offer. It's the perfect QRP companion, base station features and functionalities at the tips of your fingers in a portable package covering HF, 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in just over 2 pounds with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. 4.3 inch color touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall, 5 watts with the BP272, 10 watts with 13.8 volt DC external, single sideband, CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on ICOM radios. I found this really cool t-shirt and a ball cap. Uh, I'd like to give them away if you don't mind. Um, I've got a set just like them. I like them a lot. Mm. Um, ICOM ball cap. Yeah. And a nice ICOM ham crew t-shirt. You look just as good when you leave the ham fest as you did when you got there. As okay. I always say, like always, literally. Mm, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> okay. But uh, how could how can somebody win this? Why don't we do a drawing of the names we collect, or the emails we collect, because we we dispose of these emails after each episode. But we save them long enough to do a random drawing. If you'll send us an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv, you don't need to tell us much. Just you need a name and you need an email address. And that's all you need to enter. You don't have to be a ham. Just drop us an email, hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. And before each show, we pick out a random number and go see who that lines up with. And from there, we get a winner. And our winner for this episode, if I can find it, is Bryce Baumgartner, N4ZJW. Congratulations, Bryce. You're going to look good at the next Ham Fest or the next uh, Ham Club Zoom meeting that you attend. Because there's a lot of those going on these days rather than ham fest. But either way, uh, we'll be getting that, or ICOM will be in touch with you and getting that right out to you. And congratulations. So everyone else out there, you know, we're deleting the emails. Actually, they've already been deleted. So send us another email. We do this each month starting from scratch. So just send us an email, hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. Yep. If you entered this month, then uh, if you didn't win, you want to try again, you need to enter again for the following month. So go ahead and send them in. That sounds good. 
What is the name of the signal component that carries color information in NTSC video? A. Luminance. B. Chroma. C. Hue. R. D. Spectral intensity. What is the name of the signal component that carries color information in NTSC video? And we're talking about, you know, regular old analog television there and fast scan television for hams. Yep. Uh, well, you pretty much just answered this on the last slide. I kind of did, didn't I? A luminance, you know, we said that's a brightness of the video and that's black and white. Hue is a color. That's actually that's actually a color. Spectral intensity, though, that's that's not color. And B, chroma. That's going to be your answer right there. Chroma is carries the color information. Hue is just that represents the color, or a particular color, or a, a shift in the colors. I'm saying it's B, Chroma. Everybody got that in the chat room. Yeah, see, they all stepped up and answered that one. Yeah. Yeah, true. <laughs> they didn't leave me hanging. Um, so, easy enough on that one. If you were to demodulate the video signal and look at it, well, this is sort of what you might see. You see the line that goes through the center there, it says black level. That's zero as far as video is concerned. The first thing you come across is the sink level. The sink is going negative. It goes down below zero. The black level is the level that a black signal would be sent at. The white level is all the way at the top there. You see that's marked white level and sink level is down at the bottom. It's just a little pulse that comes between every frame of video mm. or actually every field. Sync is also called blacker than black because it's below the level of black on the television. But the sync is blanked out. You don't see that on the television. That's just used so that the picture can be synchronized so that the left-hand side of the screen is the left-hand side and the right-hand side is the right-hand side that was sent. So your television set can sync up with those, and it doesn't sit there and jerk around sideways or the picture tear or one thing or another. The next thing we come across is the color burst. And that's uh, 3.58, and I don't remember all the numbers. If that little color burst signal is present, that's telling the television receiver that, hey, this is a color broadcast that you're receiving. If it was black and white, that would be missing. Then, in the uh, sort of gray area there, you're seeing the actual video signal. Now, the black line, that's the luminance signal, so that's the brightness of the photo or the, the video frame. And the colored lines there, or the colored area, that's the chrominant signal that's kind of riding on top of the luminant signal. That is added on top of it. Because we came out with black and white television first, we had to have something compatible so that when we started having color transmissions, all the old black and white sets would still work. So we just added that color burst in there to tell the color receivers that, hey, this is a color broadcast. And if it received that, then it knows that We've got the chrominant signal riding on top of the luminance there. Then right past that, well, that's called the front porch. I didn't mention it a moment ago, but that color burst is sitting out there in the back porch. <laughs> and so back to the front porch, then we've got another sink pulse, and then the process starts all over again. So if we actually looked at this on a scope... This is a video waveform monitor right here. Television stations used to be loaded with these. They were on most everything in there. This is what color bars would look like on a video waveform monitor for an analog signal. 
You can see, you know, the things that are swinging negative there. That's where our sink pulses are. You can see the color burst plainly defined. We can see the white level, you know, is the maximum or the highest part of the signal. And then we see the bars of color, and you can see each of them is at a, a different luminance and chrominance. But you can see they're kind of stair-stepped. And what we're seeing is two fields of video. These two fields would make up one frame. What we're seeing right there is going to be transmitted 30 times each second. That's what you would look for on a video waveform monitor if you were working in a television station back in the analog era. And you'd have to make sure that all those levels were right, that um, you know the voltages were where they should be, that the sink came down to where it needed to be, that you know each one of those bars there that represents color fell into the right place. If it didn't, then your, your picture wasn't going to look right. It was going to be kind of screwed up. And it was very common for that to happen. Things could get screwed up pretty easy back in analog television. Yeah. Uh, also, all those signals are time-locked with each other. They are all synchronized together. The, uh, the sync pulse kind of sets it all up. That color burst that we were looking at there, that is synchronized mm -hmm. with that sync pulse. That's what controls the hue. If the phase of that color burst was shifted a little bit, it's changing the hue of the picture that you're looking at. So we'd use a vector scope, you know, to make sure that, that we had everything rotated, that the hue was correct, the phase was correct on it, so that it would be transmitting the right colors. And sometimes it would happen you weren't transmitting the right colors, and you'd have to do some correction to, to make that happen. So, probably more than you wanted to know about NTSC or fast scan no, television. I actually, actually, I found it very interesting. You did a good job of explaining that. The yeah. chart was really good, too. It's a yeah. nice job. See, I wish I would have known this much about it when I actually worked in television. <laughs> uh, probably would have been handy, huh? It probably would have been. I could have known a lot more than I did about it. I, I never felt like I uh, thoroughly absorbed it, but I got enough to get by, and... And I was thinking, yeah, you know, these pictures are just, they're a lot of trouble. And when I had the opportunity to get back into the radio business, I went back to it. Much yeah, uh, much less trouble. You don't have to adjust the color phase for an analog audio signal. Nobody well, it's notices. all gone now. It's all digital. So Yeah. Nobody notices, notices that the color is off on an AM or an FM broadcast signal. That is true. Yep. Can't argue with that. Yeah. You don't have to worry about the little vertical hole. Okay. Either. Well, I've got a question for you. I think you'll probably you'll do okay with this one. Well, maybe. You Let's never know. See. It's a 50-50 chance. Yeah, and uh, Ed, KD8, KCT, uh, put the frequency in there of that color burst signal we were talking about a moment ago that I um, said was 3.58. It's actually 3.579545. Oh, okay. And so, and, you know, that happens to be a ham radio frequency. And so you can use the color burst crystal that was in an old television set to actually transmit with. And I want to say I have done that before. Yeah, I have. So, kind of convenient. Hmm. All right. The question that I wanted to ask you, what technique allows commercial analog TV receivers to be used for fast scan TV operation on the 70 centimeter band? Is it A, transmitting on channels shared with cable television? Okay, B, using converted satellite TV dishes. C, transmitting on the abandoned TV channel 2. Or D, using USB and demodulating the signal with a computer sound card. What technique allows commercial TV analog receivers 
to be used for fast scan TV operation on 70 centimeters. Uh, I don't think I'm have anything to do with the dishes. I think I already know the answer, but here's me on the Bandit Channel 2. Maybe. USB? No. It's got to be A. Since it's UHF, it, transmitting on channels shared with cable TV. Okay. Got to be. Hmm. A lot of them didn't answer in the chat room, but most of those who did said that it was A. I think you're in good company there. I'm going to agree with you. And it is. Well, it says with analog, commercial analog TV receivers for fast scan TV, so and that's kind of makes sense to me. There you go, because, you know, you would, they're trying to throw you off. They got pretty sneaky there with D. So, uh huh. You know, using a computer sound card. Yeah, you would for slow. You screen. might be able. To, you could probably do that with the right stuff. But uh -huh. I don't think that's. But the question says with the commercial analog TV receiver. Yeah, well, I don't think you could get a fast scan television signal through a sound card, being you need five megahertz of bandwidth for a TV signal. Looking at the seventy centimeter band. 420 to 450 megahertz is the most commonly used band for ATV, amateur television. And the band falls between broadcast TV channels 13 and 14, which is 210 to 200, and I can't see that from here. I think it's 216 megahertz. It is 210 to 216. Yep, and 470 to 476, respectively. Propagation is similar to the lowest UHF TV broadcast channels. Additionally, this band can be easily received by simply tuning any cable-ready analog television or cable box to the cable TV channels below and connecting an outdoor television antenna. Amateur TV signals are much weaker than broadcast TV, so a preamplifier is often used to improve reception. And you can... See down there, you know, cable television, they, in the analog days, they use the same frequencies and same channels that we had in analog television. But, you know, there are gaps in uh, the television spectrum there where there are other services that, well, like amateur radio. Uh, you know, this, our 70 centimeter band lies between channels 13 and 14. You don't pick that up on your television, and we don't interfere with each other. That's because that hunk of spectrum in there is not used for television. The cable companies, on the other hand, they're not, they're not broadcasting over the air, so they've got all that additional space. They could squeeze other channels in there because on their cable, you know, there, there's not amateur radio 70 centimeters Unless somebody in the neighborhood is really burning it up, you know, <laughs> and uh, bleeding into the cable. Um, so they've got more channels on there. And you see all of those? They're 6 megahertz wide, each one of those. That's because it takes that much bandwidth. It takes 5, but, you know, we have to have our guard band in there between them. So, yeah, it takes a lot of bandwidth to send a fast scan television signal. And it shows us the frequency that the video signal is sent on. You know, we looked at that earlier. And where that at FM analog signal is sent as well. And it's not a subcarrier, the FM signal. It is an actual FM broadcast signal. It is, well, not today in digital television, but in analog television. We had two transmitters. We had one really big transmitter that just broadcast the video signal, which was AM, vesicle sideband. And then we had another whole transmitter that just broadcast the sound. And, you know, we had an aural transmitter for the sound and visual transmitter for the video. So it was two different transmitters. And the audio transmitter, the FM transmitter, was much lower power. When they first started television, they ran the same power on, on both the audio and the visual transmitters. Then, later they discovered that they could reduce the power on the 
uh, audio transmitter there, the oral transmitter, way down to like a, a tenth of what the video signal transmitter was putting out, and you still had good audio. The, the audio signal, you know, they're coming out of the same antenna. It just kind of rode on top of the video signal or kind of tailgated on and, and worked out, so they were able to reduce the power on the aural transmitter a lot. Hmm. So, I, you know, I've actually worked at a couple of television stations that, uh, well, the transmitters were huge at those places. It'd be a big, long cabinet that was the actual transmitters, you know, the, the visual and the aural. And then behind it, we had two linear amplifiers that would jack the signal up to broadcast. Some of the old RCA transmitters that we had there um, actually had two identical linear amplifiers, big ones, you know, might put out, say, 50 kilowatts. They had the same ones for the visual and the aural. Later, they found out they didn't need that one for the aural, so they just shut it off. And the aural transmitter was just, you know, the transmitter itself without a linear on it because it wasn't needed. So that's pretty interesting. You know, they learn stuff as, you know, this actually got on the air. Um, yeah, it's cool stuff. It's interesting technology. Oh, it certainly it's, was. Uh, it's interesting that all that got developed so long ago, too. And it's fairly, pretty complex. It is. It is. Uh, it was, And it was... Everything had to be perfect, man, or, you know, or you, you had picture rolling or being screwed sideways, mm -hmm. or, you know, green newscasters. You know, you could have all kinds of Seen all that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, back into the questions then. <clears throat> well, that was a nice little diversion. Well, thank you. I think we... That was most of the explaining here, and I think, oh, I think this is one you asked me. Okay. What hardware, this is where you need stuff, what hardware other than a receiver with single sideband capability and a suitable computer is needed to decode slow scan TV using digital radio Mondale or DRM? A, a special IF converter. B, a special front end limiter. C, a special notch filter to remove synchronization pulses. Or D, no other hardware is needed. Good question. I'm going to give them a second in the chat room to, to answer there. A, a special IF converter. Yeah, you don't need that for slow scan television. B, a special front-end limiter. You don't need that. You don't need a special notch filter to remove synchronization pulses. You don't need yeah, any other hardware. Yeah, if you've got, you know, an SSB receiver and a suitable computer, that's all you need to receive SSTV pictures. Don't need anything else. Yep. Sound card, basically, you just taking the audio out of the radio, running it into the sound card, and running your decoder software. Yep. Uh, and uh, some people would argue that you would need a sound card, but most of them have them built in nowadays. They do the these computer. days. Yeah. Not the greatest, but they'll work. Yep. So, let's see. Am I right? Yeah. No other hardware is needed. Uh, also, you can transmit with that. You use your software. You select your picture. Uh, when you hit the transmit button there, it generates audio tones coming out of the sound card. And you modulate your, your single sideband transmitter with that or your FM or, or you know, wherever you're going to send it. Here we're talking about um, digital radio Mondial. So uh, I think... That's generally done on single sideband transmitters. What aspect of an analog slow scan television signal encodes the brightness of the picture? Is it A, the tone frequency? B, tone amplitude? 
C, the sync amplitude. Or D, the sync frequency. I think it's going to be the tone frequency. Slow okay. scan television, you can decode it with the sound card, so that's going to be audio frequency or, or amplitude. I just think it's going to be A. I okay. don't know. And, you know, most of the people in the chat room who rendered an answer said A. They were, some of them gave two answers. Some of them did. Uh, but there's only one right answer, and it is A. Tone frequency. And I can... Well, that's what, what makes sense to me. I can kind of reason that There's out there. some explaining to do? I can do some explaining on that. I don't have pictures with arrows on them. But... Okay. First off, the sync amplitude or the sync frequency. That doesn't have anything to do with the brightness of the picture. You know, mm -hmm. sync is just there so that the pictures the lines line up so that you're not looking at an image that's torn or, you know, that the top starts where the top should be and the bottom is where the bottom should be. All those type of things. It's just synchronizing stuff so that, you know, it all lines up. The tone amplitude. Well, if you think about slow scan television, and a lot of that's done on HF, if you've ever listened to HF, you know the volume level of a signal you're receiving is all over the place, depending on the strength of the transmission. And it's, you know, a lot of times it's constantly fading in and out, you know. So the mm -hmm. amplitude is changing a lot on, uh, you know, HF single sideband. So, you know, the amplitude really wouldn't work. But the frequency, that's not going to change if the signal fades out or not, sure, you might lose the signal if it fades too low. Um, but the frequency is going to be the same regardless of the signal strength. So that just that's the easiest answer there by far because you know it's kind of, it's constant. It's not really going to shift on you. So tone frequency. What is the function of a vertical interval signal, or VIS, code sent as part of a slow scan TV transmission. A, to lock the color burst oscillator in color SSTV images. B, to identify the SSTV mode being used. C, to provide vertical synchronization. Or D, to identify the call sign of the station transmitting. What is the function of the vertical interval signal, the VIS code, sent as part of an SSTV transmission? Okay, well, let's look at these. All right, we're talking about slow scan television. We're not talking about NTSC television. So we don't have a color burst. It's not needed on slow uh -huh. scan television. We need that on fast scan. So we know it's not a... Uh, C, to provide vertical synchronization. You know, you would think maybe that is it. Um, D, to identify the call sign of the station transmitting. Nope, doesn't have the call sign embedded in there. B, to identify the SSTV mode being used. Because, you know, for, for fast scan television... For analog, you know, we really, we only use here in the U.S. NTSC. They might use PAL and, you know, other countries. But we're using, you know, what was a commercial standard in all of our um, fast scan TV is pretty much the same standard. It's always the same mode here and, you know, in other places in the world, whatever their standard was. But for SSTV... There's a lot of different modes. And you need to know what mode is the signal that you're receiving so that your decoder software will know how to decode it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say it's B, to identify the SSTV mode being used. And that sounds plausible. Uh, most of them are B. There are some mixed answers there. So let's see. I could be wrong. Well, it is 
It is B. Good job. To identify the SS TV mode being used. Yeah, there's a lot of modes, you know. And if you open up some SS TV software and look in there, you'll see there's a lot of modes, and it helps if you know the mode that the signal is coming in on. Um, yeah, I need to play with that sometime. Uh, last time when, I guess it was when the International Space Station was sending that, I was going to try, and I was out of town, and uh, I think they ended it right before I actually got home and was able to get set up to try it. Yeah. So, but I'm sure they'll do it again sometime. Yeah, I have I have received those before, and uh, the way I did it, because, you know, that pass is pretty short that goes over, and then you may not have opportunity to receive it again. So I used my sound card and recorded the sound from my radio rather than trying to decode it live. And then I could go play it back as many times as I wanted and adjust my software, you know. Oh, that's a good uh, idea. Right, yeah. Instead of waiting, instead of waiting until it come back around again. Right. No, yeah. long time. Yeah, it it made it much easier. You, could, if you didn't get it right the first decode, you could just turn around and try it right again. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's see where we are. Oh, I think we have maybe one more tonight. So just to be fair, I'll ask you. Okay. What signals SSTV receiving software to begin a new picture line? Is it A, specific tone frequencies? B, elapsed time? C, specific tone amplitudes? A or D, a two-tone signal? Get a new picture line? Well, we said the other information was done on tone frequencies, so I'm going to think it's going to be tone frequencies again. Yeah, I think it's going to be tone frequencies. Okay. Because that's pretty much the mechanism to send the slow scan TV pictures down. So I'm saying, I'm thinking it's all built into that protocol somehow. All right, that's, um, that's what they're saying in the chat room. I think you're right. There you go. Specific tone frequency. So you did you did better on these than you thought you were going to do tonight. Well, I got lucky. I got lucky on one or two, maybe. Um, and then the other ones, I guess I wasn't as unfamiliar with some of it as I thought I might have been. Um, and it, so. Yeah, they did pretty I good. I know two of them I got pretty lucky on. They did pretty good in the chat room, too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they usually do. It's a bunch of smart folks out there. Well, it is. All right. We're going to be back in just a moment. We've got just a little bit more to talk about tonight. So don't go away. We'll be right back. Are you new to the ham world or an existing amateur operator who wants to take your license to the next level? Study for your radio license exam at hamstudy.org. HamStudy.org is a free online learning tool powered by ICOM. It was created by Richard Bateman, KD7BBC, Michael Stuffelbeam, KV9G, and Rich Porter, KK6GKE, and it uses a modern web design to enhance the experience of studying for your technician, general, and amateur extra exams. Since 2013, hamstudy.org has helped new and existing hams to familiarize themselves with the question pools, use stats-based flashcards to focus on material they need to learn, and take practice exams to gauge progress. Visit hamstudy.org on your desktop computer or mobile device. Register for a free account at hamstudy.org to access personalized study history and other site features. Prepare for an exam in an intuitive and comprehensive manner. Check out hamstudy.org, powered by ICOM, for free learning tools. Good luck on your next exam. Just a couple more brief things to mention here tonight. Let's look at that real quick. The first one here, this is an actual SSTV signal. 
Now, I did not receive this. This was posted on Wikipedia. That's slow scan television. You can see there is snow in that picture in more ways than one. There <laughs> looks like there's snow on the ground, but then, you know, snow yeah, in the some picture. Some of it's colored snow. Yeah. So that's an analog transmission. You know, they're doing all that uh, transmitting and receiving with tone frequencies. Not bad. You know, some of the early ones actually... You had a camera feeding straight in to the transmitter or the encoder. You know, you, you weren't using like a graphic in a file on a computer. One of those, this one right here, this is a famous picture. Oh. That's the astronaut stepping on the moon. And that awesome. was sent with slow scan television. They actually had a black and white camera that was really low resolution there. You can see the lines that are in there. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about NTSC, analog television, tonight. Let's just also mention that there is a DATV, digital amateur TV, and that uses mm, two different systems there to work. It uses DVB-T or cable QAM, cable QAM. Yeah. And I've got... Sounds like one of them is our over-the-air digital television, and the other is what the cable system uses. Yeah, I think Peter's group over there, or down there in Australia, was uh, kind of switching over to the digital. Yeah. And you remember on uh, Amateur Logic, on the, one of the later segments that he did before uh, he moved on, he did one, uh, had a whole bunch of uh, QSOs or contacts using the uh, digital amateur television and they look some of them look really good oh yeah they they look excellent um pretty much whatever you put in is what you get out on that uh, mm -hmm. not always the case with analog but you know it's a totally different mode uh yeah it's pretty big in melbourne uh it's pretty big on the west coast here i believe and we don't most of the country, we don't have it really uh, spread out that well yet, but it's coming. People are moving to it. Uh, that is not covered at all on the extra exam. There's no questions on digital television on there. Uh, let's see. Slow scan television. It's uh, mainly done by amateur radio operators. I'm looking at my cheat notes here. We can transmit and receive static pictures. That means just, you know, still frame pictures. And either mono, which is black and white or color. Now, the literal term SSTV is narrow band television. It means it doesn't take a lot of bandwidth to transmit that picture. Analog television broadcasts, as we mentioned earlier, you know, need six megahertz wide channels there. Uh, because, you know, we're transmitting 25 or 30 pictures or 30 frames per second in NTSC, PAL, or CCAM color systems. But SSTV takes up a maximum of about 3 kilohertz of bandwidth. So we can easily do it, you know, on amateur radio, on, uh, on single sideband, on FM. We could do it with AM. It only takes three kilohertz. That's like a typical, you know, voice channel width. Uh -huh. It's much slower because it's not real-time pictures. All we're interested in is getting the picture across, not really how long it takes to get across. So it can be anywhere from about eight seconds up to a couple of minutes, depending on the mode that's used to transmit one frame image. Because we're only sending one frame at a time with slow scan television. And yeah. uh, the term slow, yeah, you would think, yeah, it's not fast. It, you know, it can come through slow. And since SSTV systems operate on uh, voice frequencies, uh, it, it can operate there. Or you can use it on VHF and UHF. Yeah, so. that's interesting. I don't know even know why they actually really call it TV because it's more like picture sharing. Yeah, it's um, almost you'd you'd more want to call it facsimile. Yeah, you know, I used to fool around with the WeFax stuff a long time ago mm -hmm. with a short wave receiver and uh, receiving the weather maps, uh, stuff like yeah. that. And uh, 
It was cool stuff. Jimmy Jimmy Burrell's one that got me interested in that. Yep, I remember that. So, slow scan television and fast scan television, very little resemblance. You know, they're pretty much two totally different things. The only thing in common is that, you know, the visual aspect. Uh, one is sending one picture at a time, the other is sending many and has full motion to it. So there you go. That is, that's about all the uh, amateur television questions you'll have. There are a couple of other questions scattered throughout the exam pool there, but that is the majority of them right there that we just covered here tonight. Yeah, those that section turned out to be not too hard. A uh, little studying, there are a few things that, a uh, few basics that you probably already know, and then a few things to kind of learn. Um, that aren't real common, but uh, that section was wasn't too bad. No, it wasn't. I, my humble opinion. Yep. Yeah. Okay, before we get out of here, just a couple of things to mention. Number one, and you know, because we only gave away one T-shirt tonight. With winter coming on, could be getting cold. What might you it need to do? It is going to be getting cold. Yeah. It's free, like I said before. It's frigid here. It's in the 60s. Yeah, 50s. It's in the 50s now. Oh, yeah, 50s now. Yeah. If you need something to stay warm, you can always go to amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com. If you if you didn't win the ICOM swag, you can go here and pick yourself up some ham college or amateur logic swag. We've got some caps. Uh, we've got some mugs to keep you a nice warm cup of cocoa or coffee in. Uh, there are jackets and hoodies and stuff on there, uh, shirts. So go check it out. And uh, there's a lot of cool stuff. I think you found to be something that you're interested in there. Probably so. I know I am, and I have some items out of there. You were going to wear one yeah. tonight, but decided better about yeah, it. Yeah, it turned out, you know, I keep joking about it being cold, but it's actually been a nice little cool snap compared to what we've had. And I was going to wear my ham college t uh, sweatshirt but when i got in here with the computers going and the door shut it started warming up pretty fast so i might have to wait for a temperature drop just a little bit more before i break that out yeah. maybe maybe next month okay um a couple other things we want to mention first is throughout the month you know because we only do ham college at the end of each month you can catch up with us and find out what's going on through one of our social media groups, facebook.com slash groups slash ham college or slash amateur logic. Yeah, we're on Twitter at ham college and at amateur logic. Mm -hmm. And we've also, I'll go ahead and take that last one too since I'm on a roll. Um, we also have a groupsite.io group at groups.io slash g slash Amateur Logic, and a lot of people have dropped uh, Facebook and some of the other ones. Um, this is not uh, like that if you're not familiar with Groups I.O. It's almost uh, more like a, a mailing list type thing, and you can subscribe to it. That way you'll get the posts when we're going to go live or contest things are going on or you know things like that. There's not a lot of traffic on it, and you can limit or get as much or little of it as you want. You can get an email every time something's posted or one digest a day, a summary per day. So uh, it's a good answer for a lot of people that aren't into the social media thing. So check us out at groups.io slash G slash Amateur Logic if that's you. Yeah, we, we you always like. post in there when there's going to be a, another episode stream live so you don't miss. And one other thing, and that's the AmateurLogic.tv slash wiki you can get your show notes there for amateur logic and ham college both in one friendly location yeah yep. if you want to know what's on one of the shows or something uh you know we used to get a lot of emails about that uh if that's we've done so many shows i can't remember most of them so that's where i go to look it up and you can save yourself some time and go look there yep all right well that's gonna do it for this month's Ham College, uh, tomorrow is Halloween here, so have a spooky old time. Well, it is spooky already in 2020, but... 
Well, it's been a spooky year. It no has. doubt about that. Yep. So stay safe out there, and we'll see you next time. All right, and join us for the next Amateur Logic uh, around the 15th of November. Yep. All right, 7 3. Sign up for those uh, posts I was talking about, and you'll get notified. 7 3. The audio in an NTST television signal, did I say NTST? NTSC television signal.